Hello and welcome to I Could Murder a Podcast. We are back once again with a brand new episode. And I'm joined by, well, of course it is, the notoriously naive, the nefariously nervy, the nan nuzzling numbskull, Ben Carter. Nan nuzzling. Was prepared for almost all of that. Um. <laughs> you, I bet you were expecting another N word, which I didn't say. The, the opposite of a nan nuzzler, but. You've lost me. Nonce. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thrilled to be here. Um, very excited for this week's episode um, and thrilled to be in your company, of course. How are we doing, producer Dan? Very good. I can't believe we're on episode seven now. Just want to shout out a little bit to our lovely community because I've been reading all the comments on YouTube. It's amazing. Overwhelmed with love. So thank you so uh, not, much. Not, not to uh, shit on that, Dan, but uh, we did have a lot of comments recently from um, it's, it's a lot of Spanish comments uh, basically saying... Are these the cockroaches? Um, yeah. Which I got very confused about. Basically did a bit of a deep dive on where these came from. Came from TikTok. Came from a Spanish editor who basically was calling out someone that didn't pay him for his work. He did some clues, but he didn't say specifically who the person was. People got the clues, came to the idea that it was us. Wow. And then they were calling us, saying, telling us, pay the editor, pay the editor. <laughs> are these the cockroaches? Um, <laughs> turns out, no, we're not the cockroaches. Uh, or, or maybe we are, but not for that reason. Uh, and I was like, but we've got beautiful Ben Bonsi doing our editing. So um, we're not, we're not eat- so yeah, that was fun. <laughs> but we haven't paid him in three years. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I was like, we haven't paid him right down, down, we haven't paid him. <laughs> and then, um, then I found out Ben Bonsi could speak perfect Spanish. So that was fun. Pagar el editor. I think that's kind of pay the editor. Nice. nice. But yeah, that, that guy's uh, clues uh, sent people right off the scent, which uh, I definitely did with last week's cryptic clue. I've had about 14 messages, um, none of which quite got this week's case, which is, of course, the North Sentinel Island. That Yorkshire guard is looking all over the place. Yorkshire, North, guard, Sentinel, looking all over the place. Island. <laughs> that is dog shit yeah. um and yeah that was that was for a meal with ben Carr. yeah it? it was narrowly missed out maybe we raffle that off yeah <laughs> yeah we can raffle that off um sure and I've, I've i've had a little new tour last week went to new york and newcastle in a week oh, the two news so all the news yeah maybe nuki this week and then after that um newport newport yeah newport uh then after that like <sighs> newton new cliff newton a cliff by the way, did you did you find a nice vegan pizza over in New York? I ate normal pizza. Ah, oh, we did find we did oh. find a good we did find a good vegan pizza across the road. Yeah, and I I got a, I got a pizza tattoo. Oh which yeah, was, which was half the battle and a little ghost. Um, so that was fun. But yeah, lovely old time. Brilliant. And a quick shout out to my cousin Kevin Bell who listens to the podcast all the way over in Sydney. Um, yeah, I, I gave him one of our new mugs and he was very delighted. Just check them out. Why don't you go on the website? There, Ben's holding it. New <laughs> neon mug. Rumour says that if you hold it really close to a t- uh, the light for ages and have it in the dark, it glows in the dark. It doesn't. But, <laughs> That's um, a false rumour. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's a lie. Uh, but anyway, uh, Ben, are you able and uh, ready <laughs> to introduce what this week's case is? Absolutely. So this week is the case of the mysteries of North Sentinel Island, uh, which is also referred to as the murder of John Allen Chow, the most isolated tribe on Earth, the Forbidden Island, and the dark side of the Andaman. Uh, And the Yorkshire Guard is looking all over the place. You never can tell with those Yorkshire Guards where their eyes will land, I island. Uh, This doesn't work at all. Forcing it a bit. Mm, maybe put that one to the job centre because it doesn't work at all. But um, Dan, are you able to set the scene for this week's case? Yeah, sure. Why not? North Sentinel Island, situated deep within the Bay of Bengal, is one of the most remote and mysterious places on Earth. Predominantly, the island is known for its robustly guarded isolation and the dangers it presents to many outsiders ensnared by its allures. Home to the Sentinelese, one of the last remaining uncontacted tribes in the world, the island is legally off-limits to visitors due to the tribe's supposed extreme hostility towards outsiders. Attempts to approach or make contact with the Sentinelese have resulted in vigorous rejection, violent encounters and even the loss of lives, with the tribe fiercely defending their territory with bows, arrows and spears. The risks posed by the Sentinelese hostility, combined with the island's dense jungle terrain and lack of infrastructure, make any attempts to visit or explore North Central Island 
extremely perilous and highly discouraged. Yet, some people are still dare to tread foot on its shores. So yeah, this week, oh, I'll hold my hands up. I feel like we've had a couple of curveballs in this series. This is very much my big curveball of the series. Uh, this case fascinates me. It has for a long time. And not only the island itself and the mystery surrounding it, but the people that find themselves captivated by the island are also super interesting. And we're going to focus on John Allen Chow in particular, but also give a bit of a background on the island. Um, I think it's definitely fair to say this would be a case that not many people expected us to be covering. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is definitely a curveball. Um, when I was looking around for you know things to research this, there was bits and pieces, but a lot of it seemed to be fairly short form, which kind of alludes to the fact that there's not like loads and loads of detail out there on the case. Um, but it's yeah, it's a it's one very different to one we've covered before. It's hard to put this one really in a category. But yes, as we always like to do, we start off with a quote as well. And this one comes from Amanda McBain, one of the co-directors of the 2023 film The Mission, which documents the history of both John Chow and the North Sentinel Island. The Sentinelese are a tribe that have existed for more than 50,000 years. They have generally been left alone, except for some key moments that were traumatising. In the last 40 years, the Indian government has protected the island. It's illegal to go there for any reason, and it's also an issue of consent. So what John Chow did back in 2018 was not only an immoral act, it was also an illegal one. Well, it says immoral. We'll get into it. We'll get into it. Um, but yeah, it's, it, as I said, there's going to be some big looping questions. I've got this. quite a strong opinion. I'm almost going to have to rein it in, I feel, which is very unlike me. No, you give it. Uh, if you've got a strong opinion, it, stick yeah, by it. I will. Just don't yeah, want to go yeah. too far and upset some people. Nope. Ooh. Always conscious of upsetting people, but... No, but yeah, Ben, well, of course. I mean, I guess don't give the opinion now because you probably will spoil it for everyone. Sure. Um, but maybe later on when, when the opinion really bubbles over. Mm. Well, when you're boiling your eggs and you oh, get distracted. But anyway, we're going to take a look at the island's vast history as well as all of the lives that have been drastically altered as a result of their obsessions and encounters with it. We'll then look into John Chow and his background before seeing exactly how their paths crossed. So we'll start with the island. North Sentinel Island, nestled in the Bay of Bengal, India, is one of the 836 Andaman Islands. And though only 31 of these particular islands are permanently inhabited, North Sentinel remains by far the most remote and enigmatic of the lot. It's coated in a history of mystery, isolation and intrigue. Surrounded by coral reefs and dense forests, the island is home to the Sentinelese, one of the last predominantly uncontacted tribes in the world. So as, as we'll go through, there have been... Slight pieces of contact throughout the last century, but um, they've never really ended too well. And the island, for the most part, has captivated explorers, traders, researchers, and missionaries for many centuries. It's coded in a history of mystery. I love that, yeah. I was going to go into a bit of a rap. Yeah? I was going to, but then I decided <laughs> against it, because I only got one bar, one bar car to... With an area of approximately 23 square miles, uh, 60 square kilometres for uh, those in the US, North Sentinel remains almost completely untouched by modern civilization, serving as a sanctuary for its indigenous inhabitants who fiercely protect their territory from outsiders. The common comparison that you'll hear almost every documentary I've watched is that it's roughly the same size as Manhattan, uh, where Tom was the other week. Um, but for our UK folks, it's the same size as Guernsey. Oh. Um, so, you know, a bit of a spanner in the works there. North Sentinel Island sits just 22 miles away from civilization, though its inhabitants will never know it. The Sentinelese people, believed to number anywhere between 39 to 400 individuals, are believed to have inhabited the island for up to 60,000 years, living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle and maintaining their traditional customs and language. Uh, which again, well, language, we'll talk about that a bit more, but it's very unique and not spoken anywhere else in the world. They have survived for centuries on a diet consisting of wild boar, sea turtles, different kinds of fish and mollusks, as well as fruits and roots. Which again, I was really in sort of a, a rapping mood when I... The Sentinelese have consistently resisted contact from the outside world, and we'll, yeah, we'll explain why they have uh, their reservations on this, using their isolation to preserve their autonomy and cultural heritage. Though there have been some notable and highly traumatic exceptions to this, including, but not limited, to the following. In the late 13th century, famous explorer Marco 
Polo allegedly was one of the first Europeans to observe North Sentinel Island as he sailed by it whilst exploring the Andamans, uh, which uh, that's where Adamant come from. So Adamant from Adamans. Uh, in 1296, he wrote the following in his diary based on his sail by. The island hosts a most brutish and savage race, having heads, eyes and teeth like those of dogs. They are very cruel and kill and eat every foreigner whom they can lay their hands upon. Which is pretty uh, a crazy observation considering he was miles away from there when he had the observation. Uh, it wouldn't be until 1771 when the next notable observations were made, this time by British surveyor John Ritchie, who was sailing by the island on an East Indian survey vessel, the Diligent, which is a great name for a survey vessel. If I, if I have a surveyor come to my house, I want him to be diligent. <laughs> when he noticed several bright burning lights in the distance. He described what he witnessed as a multitude of lights, lanterns and bonfires across its shores, appearing like a sentinel. Richie did not dare to venture closer to the island, though his observations perhaps contributed to the island's later name. I'm guessing it probably definitely did. Do you know uh, what my survey vessel was called? I've given you ammo there. Go on. The loosely went a bit like that. Curved edge. The sinking. <laughs> um... <laughs> In 1867, during the climax of monsoon season, Nineveh, which was an Indian merchant ship, became shipwrecked when it collided with coral reef on the shores of the island. All 106 survivors of the wreck set up temporary camp on the beach, but were repeatedly attacked by the Sentinelese over the coming days. Which, if you're shipwrecked, you're on a beach. I'm just thinking of Lost and thinking of all those like Bear grill survivors thing. You're already like annoyed about just, obviously it's a, it's a big hassle. And then you've got all the bugs biting you all night. Mm. And then you've got a man throwing a spear at you. It's, it, it, very anxiety inducing. It eventually forced all 106 of them to go back to the wrecked ship. Fortunately for them, they were discovered by a Royal Navy rescue steamer. The Nineveh's captain described their encounter as follows. The savages were perfectly naked. Oh, God. Damn. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. Can you say what the captain said, please? <laughs> <laughs> God, here we go again. <laughs> My intrusive thoughts. <laughs> the savages were perfectly naked with short hair and red-painted noses, and were opening their mouths and making sounds like pa un a. Their weapons were somewhat advanced, with their arrows appearing to be tipped with iron. In 1880, a British expedition led by Maurice Vidal Portman, uh, and there are some, yeah, there's some very disturbing stories about this particular man, was sent to North Sentinel in order to conduct research on the island and its inhabitants. After arriving, the research team discovered several small, seemingly abandoned villages inland. And after spending almost a week on the island, how they did this, I'm not quite sure. But it's believed that essentially they lured a small group of uh, Sentinelese too close to their dinghy um, and were able to somehow... <laughs> it's basically an abduction. Uh, they got six... Um, of the Sentinelese on their dinghy, took them back to the boat and then took them back to Port Blair. And this group of six was made up by an elderly couple and four children. And as soon as they got them back to Port Blair, all six of them became incredibly sick almost immediately. The elderly couple actually died within a few days and so the four children were returned to the island with numerous gifts. So obviously um, we have vaccinations and whatnot and uh, we have different diseases and different countries have different diseases, hence you have to have vaccinations to travel to different places in the world. Um, with obviously the Centrelees being so um, isolated over this time, it's basically it's what the British expedition had brought over their diseases they've never ever, ever experienced. So basically their bodies weren't able to uh, fight off these diseases or this illness in, in any particular way. So. Yeah, it's essentially, I know, obviously, um, Dan being an anti-vaxxer, it, it's, it's slightly going against that, but it's showing that <laughs> it's basically, yeah, it was essentially they, were, they weren't vaccinated or have any kind of tolerance against these illnesses that the British brought over there. And then so from this, obviously, the children have been returned with numerous gifts. Sentinelese are now obviously wondering where their elders have gone um, and they've returned the children with diseases and um, and viruses that could then potentially cause the whole island to become incredibly, incredibly unwell. Um, yeah. So this is, yeah, this is sort of the first element of where we see a real distrust start to develop with outsiders. Uh, and obviously the impact of this was significant. 
Later in the same year, the British conducted an additional expedition to the North Sentinel Island following the theft of a ship's longboat. Uh, so apparently, Maurice Vidal Portman, despite what he had already done, um, claimed that one of his longboats had been stolen. Uh, so they sent another expedition to try and retrieve it. Uh, however, the expedition encountered hostility from the Sentinelese, who defended their territory fiercely, which led to a retreat from the British, uh, and they were not able to achieve their objectives. Almost two decades later, in 1896, a prisoner escaped from the prison at Port Blair, and he managed to flee on a makeshift raft. Eventually, he washed ashore on North Sentinel Island, but it's unclear for how long he was able to survive there. What is known is that just a few days later, a search party found his naked body on the beach of North Sentinel with his throat slit and multiple arrows in his body. In 1967, the Indian government declared North Sentinel Island and its surrounding waters a tribal reserve, providing legal protection for the Sentinelese people and their territory. So we're going to fast forward to 1974, and a combined team of anthropologists, armed police, National Geographic photographers and film crew made their way to North Sentinel bearing a collection of gifts, including fresh fish, pots and pans, toys, a child-sized doll, several coconuts and a live pig. It's quite a Christmas. As soon as the team uh, could place the items on shore and release the pig, they were met by a number of the Sentinelese who immediately started firing arrows at them. Uh, the pig was immediately slaughtered and spears were placed into the dull. The film crew were fired upon as they made their way frantically back towards their boat to fire a small dinghy, with the film's director being struck in the left thigh. Which makes me think of Ace Ventura when he gets the spear in the thigh. Oh, yes. As they got back on the boat, they observed the Sentinelese burying all the gifts together with the dead pig. So this moment, not all of it, but the moment where the arrow is found in the director's uh, fight is, yeah, there's this footage of this and it's, it is all a bit scary. And obviously that footage then going worldwide afterwards only increased the uh, awareness and intrigue of North Sentinel. I would have taken that as a deterrent. I would too, there. yeah. yeah. I get it. Like people were like, oh, no, I, I can change them. <laughs> um, which, uh, yeah, it's just very arrogant. On the 2nd of August 1981, Panamanian freighter ship known as MV Primrose grounded on the surrounding reef of North Sentinel Island. Initially, the crew were extremely happy to see land near to the wreck, but the happiness was short-lived as they witnessed a dozen Sentinelese approaching the shores, waving weapons towards the sky. The group appeared to begin to construct small wooden boats in an effort to get to the shipwreck. An urgent distress call was sent out, which relayed the following message. Wild men, estimated to be more than 50 of them, carrying various homemade weapons are making two or three wooden boats, worrying they will board us at sunset. All crew members' lives are not guaranteed. That's terrifying, isn't it? I mean, how quickly can a boat be built? Because mm. if you can't move anywhere and you're not armed yourself and there's nowhere else out, uh, that's terrifying. Seven hours. I could probably build a boat in. Do you reckon? Uh, solid. Yeah, I mean, I guess a boat is just a thing that's, that, that floats, isn't it, really? You'd like to think so, yeah. Well, I've been watching a, uh, a Netflix series called Outlast. Great and, show! Uh, it's, it's pretty good. Um, and one of the... The amount of fucking things I've recommended you to watch, and then you find <laughs> that oh, there's other dog shit stuff to watch in between. No, it's good. you'll like it. You'll like it. I'm not going to watch it. I'll send you a link. I don't think, I don't think Tom would like it, actually. Is it, is it just a bit pandering and a bit like... <laughs> <laughs> bit dumbed down well anyway they're they're different teams um it is actually uh, uh, <laughs> it's good it's, it's very really good. good i love it it's good. different teams are basically abandoned in the alaskan wilderness um they are starved for a few days and then they're told okay there are crab traps on this particular island and you need to build a raft to get to this island and whichever team builds the you know biggest strongest raft quickest will obviously get the crab traps and um there's a guy on the losing team that ultimately makes the best raft, um, but it takes him about two and a half days, whereas the rest of them have have constructed a boat or a raft within a few hours. Oh, wow. Well. So, yeah. Imagine those hours going by, though, back on the MV Primrose. and uh, oh. I'd be feeling crabby by that point. Mm -hmm. Rescuers were not able to reach the Primrose for an agonising eight days, during which time the crew managed to fend off the Sentinels using flare guns, axes, and homemade weapons of their own. An Indian Navy tugboat eventually came to their rescue, with the Sentinelese scavenging numerous pieces of wood and iron from the shipwreck after their departure. That MV Primrose as well can still be seen. There's an aerial, one of the few aerial shots of the island. You can see parts of the shipwreck still off the off the shores uh, to date. Quite yeah, I think the tribe, if 
planes fly across the north, throw spears, and stuff like that. They're very wary of any outside contact. I mean, you'd imagine what they think that must be a plane flying across over them. This must be very like scary for them, um, not knowing at all what it would be. Well, yeah, I mean, even them seeing a boat uh, of that size and mm. then going into it to, you know, um, remove pieces of iron yeah. must be like going, like you know, a spaceship. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, fascinating. Like when Dan picked you up from your from your house, you were like, "What is this magic? <laughs> Warm seat." A very short-lasting period of friendly contact was made with the Centralese in 1991 by Indian anthropologist Trilignath Pandit and four of his colleagues. The team frequently distributed coconuts to the islanders who appeared to be far more welcoming, even bringing their babies to the shores to meet them. It's like when you go to those fancy villas that sort of send your breakfast out on a tray across the swimming pool. I've never, never experienced I've, that. Man. No, I've seen videos of it, but not. The team also noted that they were shown a small village made with 18 small huts, each with a small fire set out in front of it. However, the Centralese were quick to also let the team know when they outstayed their welcome. Yeah, apparently one of uh, the male members of the Sentinelese basically did a sort of cutthroat uh, gesture. And then also um, Pandit would recall saying that he also appeared to make a gesture like, I will carve out your heart. I don't know oh, what that's a, the hand that's gesture fun. for that one is. But yeah, obviously, you know, get out of here type of thing. Tapping the wrist for the watch. Come on. They wouldn't have a watch though, Ben. But it's just a gesture. More like the sun. like Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite a good. That's quite a good way to say. It. I might do that next time. People have stayed there. Welcome to my house. Just go like, cut your throat, fucker. And these visits would stop altogether, and come to an end five years later. Shortly after the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and subsequent tsunami, a helicopter belonging to the Indian government was sent over North Sentinel in order to see if they had survived the devastation. This is where a number of different, uh, well, later viral images uh, would be taken, and this would display a Sentinelese male firing arrows towards the helicopter. And there's other ones with uh, a group of the Sentinelese looking up to the sky and sort of waving their weapons. Interestingly, all of the island's infrastructure and shelter appeared to have not been impacted whatsoever by the tsunami. Uh, the only thing that was impacted in a sort of minor way was that their tribal fishing grounds had altered. Um, maybe, so. maybe morale as well? Slightly affected by it? Possibly. I, I'd imagine so. so. Yeah. I would have thought a tsunami or that, they, they would, I mean, I have, this is, welcome to Tom's ignorant hour. Uh, I would have thought they would assume natural disasters and things like that would be caused by them not doing a certain thing or a certain ritual or, so maybe it's also something that made them self-reflect a little bit on what they didn't do that year. I wonder as well if the um, Indian government had assumed that maybe the tsunami would have been fatal for the Sentinelese. Um, Are you inferring that they wanted it to be? Not inferring that, no. But yeah, only their fishing grounds altered. And the fishing ground essentially is, is sea. Finally, in January of 2006, two Indian fishermen, Sundaraj and Pandit Tiwari, had either accidentally or intentionally sailed into prohibited waters. What happened next is not known, however the pair drifted close enough to the island in order for the Sentinelese to kill them. No action was taken against the Sentinelese, and the Indian Navy as well as the Coast Guards began to patrol the waters surrounding the island, threatening to apprehend or arrest anybody that sailed within five nautical miles of it. They've essentially just got themselves a government-funded security system. Mm. Quite a result, I thought, for them. This seemed to be enough to sway most people, but not all. And we're now going to move on to uh, a bit of background on John Allen Chow. John Allen Chow was born on the 18th of December 1991 in Scottsboro, Alabama. He was the youngest of three children born to Linda and Patrick Chow, having an older sister called Marilyn and an older brother called Brian. The family of five were initially based in Alabama, later relocating to the opposite end of the country to live in Washington, Vancouver, where John would spend the majority of his highly adventurous young life. John's father Patrick was born and raised in Guangzhou, China, and had lived a remarkable life by the time that John was born. Patrick was initially working as an artist, however as a result of Chairman Mao's cultural revolution, he was forced to work on a communal farm as a plowman 10 hours a day. Uh, mainly eating cheese and pickle for seven days a week. Fortunately for Patrick, his father was able to arrange for safe passage to Hong Kong, where he stayed for two years before eventually emigrating to America. Patrick was initially based in Los Angeles, where he would pick up any odd jobs, not the um, bottom villain. He was able to before eventually buying a car and working as a taxi driver. During this time, he also began learning English from the car's radio. You're 
listening to. He's really good at saying that particular word. 105 a.m. Drive time radio. Another two years later, Patrick was accepted to study chemistry at the University of Southern California. And several years later from that, Patrick won an army scholarship, which allowed him to attend medical school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This was at an evangelical college called Oral Roberts University, the very same university his sons would later attend. So this particular university was very, very big on Christianity and very big on the Bible. Though Patrick would later say nobody really cared about religion so long as you did your work, he would still declare himself a Christian and start studying the Bible. And for me, I feel like the rest of his family, his wife and his children were very big believers in religion, believers in Christianity because they believed, whereas I feel like Patrick is a bit more, um, it was necessary for him to part of the course yeah it was all yeah i did this to get here it was a not a stepping mm. stone but i feel like he was a bit more practical in his approach to it and whilst attending a christmas party at the university patrick met and very quickly fell head over heels for linda adams uh, linda was a social work professor at the university the pair were married three years later before having three children together over the following six years not long after John was born, Patrick set up his own psychiatry practice in downtown Vancouver, whilst Linda became an organiser for the Christian Fellowship, which is Chai Alpha, at Washington State University's campus. The couple would go on to send their children to a private school, Vancouver Christian High School, whilst outside of school, religion continued to play a huge part in their upbringing and family life. Linda was a devout Christian, whilst in Patrick's eyes, he owed everything he had to his faith. John was described as a very bright and highly energetic young boy who was always smiling and had no trouble making new friends or meeting new people. During the family's weekends together, they would often go hiking or camping in different wooded areas near home and also regularly travel to different national parks in the state and surrounding states, including the very beautiful Pacific Rim National Park. These experiences with his family only fueled John's sense of adventure and love for the outdoors. When I was a little kid, my family often went camping. During that time in my life, I had a habit of eating wild things that were not meant for humans to eat, like a bright red or stark white berries. Consequently, I destroyed several sleeping bags during those outings. Why? Because he had the shits. Oh. My family stopped going on camping trips shortly after that. It must be yeah, really bad um, explosive diarrhoea if it's destroying the sleeping bag. I'd, learn my, I'd hope to learn my error after one getting through one sleeping bag yeah maybe there's very more i don't know very moorish <laughs> say moorish that's gonna say yeah maybe well they didn't he didn't quite think what have i eaten he's just sitting there going what have i eaten just eating the berries going, what mm -hmm. did i have and mum didn't make a very good breakfast <laughs> a lot of detail from him there in 2002 when john was 10 years old his family took him on holiday to hawaii and by this point a young john had already read robinson crusoe several times after finding a copy of it in his dad's study do you guys know much about that story of Robinson Crusoe? Oh, yeah, I do a little bit, yeah. Go on then. <laughs> Go on then, mate, if you know so much about it. I'm not going to recite it. No, not the whole story, word for word, but it's a general premise. If you give me a blurb, Dan. Traveller. Okay, well, basically a man gets left on an island and has to fend for himself. And um, yeah, it's basically survival on an island, really, isn't it, Dan? Robinson Crusoe tells the story of a man cast away on an island in the Caribbean for 26 years. So yeah, John was fascinated by this book and got kind of obsessed with it and the idea and were quite excited by the idea of that. Whilst the Chow family was sitting on the beach, they observed locals fishing by the sea and John made the claim in front of the whole family that one day he would live a life just like them. What fishing? So it's like basically saying I'm going to go fishing. And though the family found this moment quite amusing... <laughs> fish the notion of the island life was certainly something that wouldn't shake from john's mind chow family home would also fuel john's desire for travel all of the walls in the house were adorned by paintings that his father had done most of which were landscapes of lakes mountains tropical islands and wooded areas whilst others were of adventurers a man standing by a smoking cabin in the mountains and a solo kayaker paddling through a lake one particular painting that really resonated with a young john was his father's piece on a sailboat going through a stormy sea on this, John would recall in his travel blog. When I was a kid, I used to gaze constantly at this painting. After reading The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the first thing I did was to put my hand on the painting to see if I could enter the world of Narnia. I think my dad's painting helped spark adventure in my young soul. Why do I hike? 
to see but a brief glimpse of the glory of the Creator. When you're little, did you ever go in the back of the wardrobe and think, Tumnus? Tumnus? Either of you? Uh, no. No. Cool. Yeah, no, 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 no. no? No. I think this was the, a different Narnia as well, because I got, I thought it was the no, more I knew it was different. I knew it was different. Oh, cool, I was just saying, cool. just reference point. Yeah, it didn't get me either. Didn't get no. Me either. Whilst at school, John began to idolise many famous explorers and missionaries, including Scandinavian-American Christian missionary Bruce Olsen, who had brought Christianity to the Bari people in Venezuela and Colombia during the 1960s. And he also had a fondness for Scottish missionary and renowned explorer David Livingstone, who, yeah. Yeah, who had um, he'd served on Christian missions all over Africa during the mid-1800s. So yeah, uh, John absolutely idolised these uh, individuals. He got very immersed into religion and the idea of being able to save people um, who didn't have to be saved. In 2008, when John was 16, he was already actively going traveling, camping, canoeing, hiking and mountain climbing by himself. He was also regularly working together with his church to provide outreach to local charities. As part of a mission through his high school, John traveled to central Mexico where he helped to build an orphanage. And th this part of missionaries... I can respect sort of, you know, building off orphanages, hospitals, schools, depending on what they teach at the school. Like in the US office when Andy and Michael get in the bus. So good. <laughs> so, so good. I want to get off the bus. <laughs> but it's, yeah, there are other, there are other elements to what they do that I, I don't quite agree with, but we'll yes. go into more detail shortly. But these experiences seem to completely change something within John forever. He bonded with locals, thrived at meeting new people, and was overwhelmed by the vast differences between their life and his. And after his return and from this point onwards, John became obsessed with researching the most remote and uncontacted people on Earth. And this research led him to discover numerous islands nestled in the Indian Ocean. And I think as well, to go back to his obviously obsessions with uh, Robin, Robinson Crusoe, um, the idea of living off the land and being able to survive um, in the wilderness, he, I think that that captivated him more than the idea of saving people. He was queer for eight years. Yeah. That's fair. He had the frills for Bear Grylls. That's good, yeah. But he, yeah, I think it was a mixture of, obviously he's very immersed in his religion, but also... He likes adventure. He likes the idea of living off the land. I get very um, into the wild vibes from him. I don't know. I feel like he was impressed by and almost envious of people that were able to live alone in the wilderness. Um, and that's what's exciting him more than the religious aspect, maybe. Oh, I don't know. He seems like <clears throat> throughout, like and we'll go into it, the religion side of things was huge to him. Like he was absolutely like obsessed with the the Bible, um, and also spreading the word. So I think it's probably just a, it was a perfect combination for him. He was able to, two birds, one stone it slightly. Between 2010 and 2014, just like his father before him, John studied at and graduated from Oral Roberts University, during which time he also managed the university football team or the, the soccer team. Um, and he graduated cum laude. Cum laude. There it is. Um, welcome back. Uh, we have a bachelor's degree in exercise science. After graduating, John would spend the following four years from 2014 to 2018 traveling all over the world, sometimes as a missionary and sometimes simply to explore. And I feel like sometimes they mix it up a bit, don't they? They do a bit of missionary and they do a bit of exploring. Yeah, um, yeah it's just experiment with like different things and different people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, during this time, he had missionary trips to Kurdistan, South Africa, Mexico, and parts of the Andaman Islands, though he never visited North Sentinel at that time. John's Instagram page, which is still publicly available to date, offers a fascinating insight into John's life and his travels prior to his eventual arrival on North Sentinel Island. He posted a total of 820 images, with an additional one being posted by his family in remembrance. Almost all of his posts are mountain ranges, forests, beaches, jungles, lakes and fields. He also occasionally posted images of food, family and friends, just like just like you and I, Ben. Yeah. And Dan. And Dan. Sure. Uh, his hiking equipment and nature. In any post that John's in, um, he always has a big smile on his face, with one commenter noting in remembrance. Your life was a celebration. You lived hundreds of lives in your 27 years. This is how every human should exist. I wish I could have met you. On researching John's social media footprints, the directors of the mission made the following remarks. 
It's one of the first things we looked at. Of course, it's not the whole John. He was very careful in how he presented himself publicly. He was keeping a lot secret. But it's very appealing. He was an outdoorsman, a mountaineer. He loved life. He had friends. He wasn't a reclusive loner on a suicide mission. He was a complicated human being, not the caricature that was portrayed in the media. And yeah, the mission um, would get a bit of flack after this, uh, this, this case, and especially from John's family, but we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit later on. Visiting them four times in as many years, he ultimately made the decision that North Sentinel Island and the Sentinelese people were his calling. He became transfixed and he became dedicated, placing a poster of a satellite image of the square-shaped unknown land in his room. His new purpose in life was this island and to serve the inhabitants of it. In one of his final diary entries, he referred to North Sentinel as Satan's last stronghold on Earth. And according to his father Patrick, John had finally found the last frontier of unexplored land and people untouched by Christianity. He was excited. It seemed as if the place and the people were specifically left for him. My heart sunk because his calling was his fantasy. So yeah, I mean, basically yeah, his point about Satan's last stronghold on Earth is because the word of Christianity hadn't reached them. A lot of the criticism John gets in this case, and it's not usual that the, we'll say the victim gets criticised a lot in the cases that we cover in particular, but the kind of arrogance towards Christianity and thinking that he knew the best way and, and like these people who have survived happily for many thousands of years need to be taught a better way of living because living wrong. It's a bit very arrogant and patronising. I think he falls into those categories for that. Well, how, how, and again, not to get too deep into the religious aspect yet, but how did he know that the Sentinelese were not worshipping God in the way that God wanted them to worship God? How, why did it have to be his way? Exactly, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they, they probably, I'm sure that they obviously the Sentinelese have their own beliefs and they follow their own thing. And as we said, that they, they've happily lived isolated and What's to say they're not living a better life? Definitely. But additionally to this, when John was back in America, at any given time, he would live in a small one-person cabin on Whiskey Town National Recreation Park, where he also worked for the National Park Service. Unfortunately, in 2018, 97% of the park was burnt down after a visitor driving with a flat tire on his trailer caused several sparks to ignite dry bush along the road. That is... Yeah. Oof. Always check your tires. Always check your tires. And be careful on the dry brush. This incident, known as car fire, resulted in eight people dying, including three firefighters. Yeah, there are images of this. It looks uh, horrifying. Um, yeah. And all just from a f yeah, flat tyre. John, who was present at the time, took these events as a sign from God. What sign was that, John? Like, what, what can you take from that? Yeah, I definitely should go to that island. Okay, that's not really... Just maybe just... Just maybe just check people's tyres. Um, so we have the background of the North Sentinel, we have the background on John Chow, now we will explore how the pair came to meet, and it's here that we move to the timeline of North Sentinel Island and the murder of John Allen Chow. 2017. After several years of research, John Allen Chow begins planning and preparing for his mission to North Sentinel Island. He becomes so fixated on his purpose that he quits his job and does not work full time for a year and a half in order to fully prepare. Although it says that he quit his job, I think he was kind of made redundant by the, uh, the, the fire. So during this time to fully prepare, he would study different local languages believed to be at least somewhat intelligible to the Sentinelese, including the South African language, Zosa. As well as this, uh, he got 13 vaccinations for the trip, and he also learned first aid in training up as a medical technician. As well as this, John put a whole new fitness regime in place. He started to work out on a regular basis, he went on long distance runs, and he also started a new diet. He did all of this whilst continually traveling around America and the wider world. And he would only tell a few uh, select friends and members of his uh, church that of his, of his actual plans and what he was preparing for. And in telling them that he was gonna go to North Sentinel, he basically stated, the eternal lives of this tribe are at hand. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, like, you can't argue his diligence and, like, you know, he's obviously, he's doing the right, the vaccinations, he's, he's taking responsibility for, for that, but at the same time, he's vaccinating to pre prevent himself getting things. It's not actually covering them for his diseases. It's covering him from their diseases. That's kind of like, yeah, it's not actually as thoughtful as it may sound. And obviously, yeah, the swimming and whatnot it would, would be very helpful for what he's looking to do. But yeah, he, he's very fast, he's very obsessed and obsessed with it and has a clear plan in mind. And you can't argue with that side of things. 
but yeah the, the, again he's kind of putting himself a bit in like a god complex with the their lives are in my hands and they you know it's it's very uh kind of disturbing that side of it yeah and i also feel obviously he idolized these other famous missionaries and i feel like perhaps also again i don't know how much but i think part of this is also he maybe wants to get a bit of a hmm, celebrity out of this perhaps or some notoriety but in the evangelical scene yeah yeah um but we'll we'll discuss that more shortly Perhaps surprisingly, John also obtained a sponsorship for his journey. A beef jerky company by the name of Perky Jerky uh, supposedly provided him with an unlimited supply of their product in return for John sharing their item on his social media. And yeah, going back through his Instagram, uh, you can see at least half a dozen posts um, with the Perky Jerky packets uh, in his photos, which again, I was surprised by the number of flavours. I had had some vegan jerky when I was in New York. Um, yeah. It was pepperoni flavour. Oh, mm. was it perky? No, um, and they did remind me of one of the best adverts that I kept replaying over there, going, "Smell funky, get skunky." And it's like this, like you wet this like thing and rub it on your arm, and basically it's like a portable like washcloth that makes you all soapy and cleans yourself. Oh, but, nice. Um, but it's just <laughs> smell funky, get skunky. It's just yeah. both of them are bad smells. Yeah, get some, get getting skunky wouldn't make you think you're getting skunky no, smelling, but no. yeah. Double negative, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so yeah, at this point as well, and people try and tie it together. Oh, they sponsored his mission. They sponsored his trip to North Sentinel. Looking at the dates of these posts, I mean, there are mountain ranges and all sorts where he's got a packet of jerky on the go. I feel like they sponsored him long before um, he actually went on this mission. Because as well, he also had 17,000 followers by this point and was also already sponsored by an open toe sandal company. Um, so there you go. There you go. Later in the year, John took part in a three-week missionary boot camp called All Nations over in Kansas City. And as part of the program, I think as well, John informed, um, you know, high-ranking members of this particular boot camp of his plans. They then started to prepare him for situations he might face in his attempts to get to North Sentinel. So as part of this, John was dropped off on a remote dirt road and given instructions on how to locate a mock village deep within the local woods. When he eventually arrived at the coordinates, other missionaries would play the roles of hostile tribespeople armed with spears and bow and arrows. They were preparing John, as I mentioned, for what he would likely encounter, but sadly, no preparation would be enough for what John would actually face. October 2018, after saying goodbye to his family and friends without knowing that it would be the last time he would see them, John travelled to Cape Town, South Africa, where he spent almost a fortnight before slowly making his way towards Port Blair, which is the capital city of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Upon his arrival, he began to prepare several initial contact kits for the center lease, which included gifts, medical equipment, food, photo communication cards, waterproof Bibles, and fishing equipment. I'm doing the research for this. I listened to a podcast where and it, was, it speaks about a tribe being given a mirror. They've never seen their reflection before and how much of a negative impact it had on the tribe and the people. November 2nd, 2018, John publishes what would become his final post on Instagram, a fire photo carousel of an undisclosed jungle waterfall with the caption, Adventure awaits, so do leeches. But I got my jerky, where's my beaches? <laughs> no, uh, it wasn't that. Uh, the fourth and fifth photo show, uh, show a leech between his toes ugh, and a pair of feet and sandals. Maybe that's his open toe sandal sponsor as well. Amongst the 12 separate hashtags are Never Stop Exploring, Perky Jerky, Endless Summer and Soli Dio Gloria, uh, which is Latin for glory to God alone. So after this, all we have to go by are his diary entries and witness testimony. November 14th, 2018, after a few weeks in Port Blair, John makes the following diary entry. I've been in a safe house in Port Blair since returning from Hut Bay, Little Andaman, for the past 11 days. I hadn't seen any full sunlight till today, and my nice tan I'd acquired started to fade, as well as my thickly calloused feet. The benefit of that is that I was essentially in quarantine. I met last night with a fisherman who are all believers and who agreed to drop me off. The meeting went well. I trust them. The drop zone was pointed out on the map as being a cove on the southwest of the island, and I depart in three or so hours. The plan is to link up with the crew and depart tonight, arriving at the shore around 400 hours. From there, we make progressive contact with fish and gifts over the next few days then send me off. Depending on the darkness, 
I might land briefly and bury and cache the pelican case for later. We might even send the kayak laden with gifts towards shore. So for the whole vibe I got from that journal entry is that it almost sounds like he's preparing for some sort of invasion. Mm. He Obviously, I understand that he's... I mean, a, a point worth making is that at this particular time, obviously, the Indian government had made this a restricted area. It was patrolled by the Navy and Coast Guard. Um, but he's also going darkness to arrive on the island without any confrontation so it just got a very invasive vibe yeah, as if he knows what he's doing is and the, and the thing is the medical training was because he was fully prepared to be shot by arrows yeah and he's fully prepared to be attacked again don't go like, if you think i know the point is but it's like look they really don't want you there mm-hmm. and it's have respect for them and for what you know their culture like just leave them to, i don't understand it like you can do a lot of missionary work in places where people will be more receptive to it. And, you know, it's you know, turning people's life around and stuff like that. It can be very positive. But, yeah, just, um, yeah, it does seem like he 100% knows he's, what he's doing is, is in the wrong. Definitely. And, and as we mentioned, th- th- at this time, it was illegal to go there. The Indian government had recently removed a total of 29 inhabited islands from restricted area permits to make them, you know, now available to go to in an effort to boost tourism. But uh, yeah, North Sentinel was not uh, one of the ones you could visit without permission. And you'll 100% see, as as Tom just mentioned, that John is completely aware of, uh, of, of the legalities to this and potentially the immoralities to this as well. And due to the fact it was illegal, John had somehow managed to persuade the fishermen, as he mentioned in the journal entry. And again, that's that's a bit of luck, although I suppose money might have influenced that um he so he basically uh, convinced these fishermen to take him as well as his kayak close enough to north sentinel island so that he could then paddle the rest of the way to the shores before returning to their boat obviously it's surrounded by coral reef so it's very shallow at certain points larger boats find it very difficult to get close to shore and he would go on to pay each of the fishermen 168 dollars for their assistance and cooperation The following night, John provides an overview of his experiences throughout the previous night in what was his first attempt to get to North Sentinel Island. Rendezvoused successfully last night with the friends, currently on the boat, waiting to make contact. Left around 8pm and arrived around 10.30pm. But as we went north along the eastern shore, we saw boat lights in the distance and turned around, headed south and evaded them. All along the way, our boat was highlighted by bioluminescent plankton. And as fish jumped nearby, We could see them like darting mermaids shimmering along. The Milky Way was above and God himself was shielding us from the Coast Guard and Navy patrols. At 4.30am we entered the cove on the western shore and as the sun began to light the east, me and two of the guys jumped in the shallows and brought my two pelican cases and kayak onto the northern point of the cove. The dead coral was sharp and I already got a slight scratch on my right leg. Now we see a sentinel islander house and we're waiting for them to come out. We also see three large fires on the eastern shore last night. Though he would not observe any of the Sentinelese, he was able to obviously get very close to the shores and leave gifts on the island, uh, which were contained within his pelican cases. Uh, He eventually then returned to the fisherman's boat and signed off this particular journal entry with Soli Dio Gloria. So the following day on November 15th, 2018, John provides another diary update later in the day. And this one is far more vivid. Though his previous diary entry had mentioned that two fishermen had helped him to the shallows of the western shoreline, this time they take him to roughly 500 metres for away from the shoreline after observing some of the Sentinelese people on the beachfront. I advised John not to go any closer, but excited by the prospect of making first contact, he paddles over to the island. John claimed that as he approached the shores in his kayak, he heard women quote, looing and chattering before he was approached by two Sentinelese men who had emerged from the jungle with bows and arrows. In a panic, John quickly held the fish above his head, presenting it to the men before shouting, and this is where I just go, Ugh. Yeah. My name is John. I love you, and Jesus loves you. Jesus Christ gave me authority to come to you. Here is some fish. Jesus and the fish is all very kind of biblical in, in an essence. Um, I don't know if I had a little bit of wine to give them as well, but um, yeah, it just feels, again, it's like... They don't speak your language, John. He then got up and stood in the shallows to prove he was a human with legs like them. John then tried singing hymns to them, which would be annoying, which only returned silence as he felt hostility levels rising. More and more Sentinelese arrived on the beach. John felt himself surrounded and his kayak had unknowingly been pushed over to the Sentinelese by the waves, leaving John stranded. And he described the events that followed in his journal. 
Well, I'd been shot by the Sentinelese. I set off towards the North Shore. As I got closer, I heard whoops and shouts from the hut. I made sure to stay out of arrow range, and as they, about six of them, yelled at me, I tried to parrot their words back to them. They burst out laughing, speaking in lots of high-pitched sounds, probably were saying bad words or insulting me. I kept a safe distance and dropped off the fresh fish and gifts. But here's where this nice meet and greet went south. A child and young woman came behind the two gift receivers with bows drawn. I kept waving my hand to say, no bows, but they didn't get the memo, I guess. By this time, the waves had picked up and the kayak was getting near some shallow coral. The islanders saw that and blocked my exit. Then, a little kid with a bow and arrow came down the middle. I figured that this was it, so I preached a bit to them and gave them a bunch of scissors and gifts. Then they took the kayak. Then, the little kid shot me with an arrow, directly into my Bible, which I was holding in front of my chest. I grabbed the arrow shaft as it broke on my Bible. The head was metal, thin but very sharp. They then left me alone as I half waded, half swam through the broken coral to the deep where I knew their arrows couldn't reach. I then swam almost a mile back to the boat. Although I now have no kayak, nor my small pelican case and its contents, I am grateful that I still have the written word of God. Lord, is this island Satan's last stronghold where none have ever had a chance to hear your name? Mm. I mean, I don't know if he's just trying to make light of his experiences here, but he's even to say, here's where this nice meet and greet went south or they Mm. didn't get the memo, that type of thing. Like, I don't know if he's trying to use humor there, but just he's so matter of fact about they are telling you to get away from them, get off the island, don't come near them. And he's like, no, I'll preach for a bit. I'll sing for a bit. I'll hold a fish They're singing a bit. Yeah. yeah. That's where it starts getting to be like, come on, mate. Like, there's been warnings. If, if anything, I think if they wanted to kill you, they would have killed you. Oh, but completely. Yeah. Uh, there's the, um, so in that, the mission, um, I watched it last week and uh, a former uh, a missionary gives a really good description of, look, these people, if they wanted him killed, they would have killed him. That shot through the Bible was an intentional shot from the kid to mm. pierce the Bible. Um, and he should have taken that as the signal. But instead, he took it as, oh, okay, I have more work to do. But he, yeah, I think he takes everything like within the Bible, everything is symbolism, everything means something. So the Bible saving his life shows he's there for the right reason. It, it, it just, if anything, it, it spurs him on more and reiterates what he already thinks. So after these somewhat terrifying experiences, John noted in his diary that it was his plan to get some rest by sleeping overnight on the boat before returning to the island at the local point. He'd previously dropped off the gifts to a hostile reception. He made the quite poignant remark, it's weird, actually no, it's natural, I'm scared. As well as being scared, John noted that he was also feeling frustrated and uncertain. I felt some fear, but mostly was disappointed they didn't accept me right away. I can now say I've nearly been shot by the Sentinelese and I've walked and cached gear on their island. Now, I'm resting in the boat and will try again later, leaving gifts on shore and in rocks. Lord protect me and guide me. I've given them fresh fish. Maybe it was the wrong fish. (laughs) Maybe it's Albert fish. Despite trying to get some rest, John returns to his diary and makes one of his longest entries yet by stating that he had experienced a vision once he fell asleep. But he also stated that he wasn't actually asleep at all. He claimed that when he shut his eyes, he immediately saw a purple hue hovering over the island. And immediately, as soon as I read purple hue, hue, it's that eastbound plum. My plums, rab for picking. (laughs) Let the boy watch. (laughs) But he claimed it was a very frightening uh, purple hue. And it looked as though in this vision that a meteorite or a star had fallen directly onto the island. And then suddenly a white light surrounded the island and everything was restored. All of the frightening bits melted away due to the white light. Which, yeah, as Tom said, he's interpreting symbolism and bits of the Bible very, very literally here. And he's interpreting it the way that he wants to, that he feels is right. But also, maybe he's having some co- some sort of... Well, I think he's just writing this to write it down and to give colour to his story. But maybe... He's very good with his words in terms of like even the things earlier on about the mermaids and the Milky Way and stuff like that. He's very uh, quite imaginary. He's quite imaginative with what how he writes. But you're right. Maybe he's writing... These are the words he thinks they're going to be, well, forever put with him and his mission. And, you know, if he puts this like him seeing a vision, it's very, you know, burning bush and Moses and things like that. It's, it's very symbol, symbolic, symbolic heavy. Mm-hmm. And uh, he wants to have his own like... Uh, stories to tell basically 
But that's it. And then I know I mentioned earlier, maybe there was an element of him doing this for notoriety or a little bit of celebrity. But to be fair, he could go back home and and say that he got an arrow shot for his Bible, but drop Mm. gifts off. You know, that's the closest people have got in uh, at least a few decades. He could go back and say that he fucking did a whole sermon (laughs) and some of them said, yeah, that's brilliant. Because no one's going to go back there and ask. Yeah. Yeah. Like he could have gone back and lied his fucking ass off and just pretend that he said, yeah, they all thought I was really fit. Like the concert's going, oh, handsome man, handsome man. Uh, but no, it's like, it's, yeah, I actually think his, I think his intentions were to go there and to actually convert people and yeah. get them into Christianity. Because I think he even said beforehand that he would quite happily live there for years and like maybe even stay there forever because that was his mission. So I kind of yeah. think the notoriety thing, I think it's probably partly that but i do think he was true in his mission in his head which i don't agree with the mission but it was to go there for the the sole purpose of converting these people and and yeah that definitely becomes clearer now as we move into his final uh, diary entries john concludes this particular entry by saying that he had cried at that evening's sunset wondering if it would perhaps be the last one that he ever witnessed lord let your will be done if you want me to actually get shot or even killed with an arrow then so be it to you god I give all the glory of whatever happens. I don't want to die. Would it be wiser to leave and let someone else continue? No, I don't think so. I'm stuck here anyway without a passport. It almost seems like certain death to stay here. Yet, there is evidential change in two encounters in a single day. Yeah, just to mention the passport was in the, uh, one of his, his things that were in the kayak when he basically got um, okay. burgled from them. So that's why his passport is no longer on his person. None of the guys on the boat know much English to ask their opinions and tell stuff like this to. I've never felt this much grief or sorrow before. Why? Why did a little kid have to shoot me? His high-pitched voice still lingers in my head. Now that I think about it, after I got shot by that arrow, I gave it back. Man, I should have snapped it. Father, forgive him and any of the people on this island who tried to kill me. And especially forgive them if they succeed. What made them become this defensive and hostile? Why does this beautiful place have so much death? I think I could be more useful alive. I'm scared. I'm watching the sunset and it's beautiful. I am crying. Wondering if it will be the last sunset I see. I mean, what made them become this defensive and hostile is probably the hundreds of years of their people being infected and kidnapped and abducted and all sorts of horrible things by outsiders. And they've Definitely, 100%. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, to go back to to Tom's point of him now potentially even viewing himself as a martyr, um, he is more and more committed. He's even said there, shall I, shall I go home? Would it be better for someone else to take over? Obviously, he's got the passport situation. It's left on the island. Although he's showing some uh, inner turmoil doubt. here yeah. and doubt, yeah, he still seems very committed to his work and his mission. So yeah, despite this inner turmoil and obviously the many conflicting thoughts, John remains adamant that he is going to stick to the plan. He thinks about returning to Port Blair and staying in the safe house, but also worries about being deported. Obviously, if he hasn't got his passport on him, uh, that is a possibility. He arranges with the fishermen for them to drop him off close to the shore once again, but to slowly retreat into the distant seas afterwards so as not to scare the Sentinelese. Uh, so yeah, again, he's he's not got his kayak at this point. He's he's kind of he's going to have to swim a fair bit to get there as, as as shallow as the boat will be able to go in almost complete darkness once again john returns to the same spot the following morning in an effort to retrieve his kayak he brings with him fresh barracuda and tuna as a gift once again it does not go to plan he is met by bows and arrows and screaming and so john returns to the boat so the following day on november 16th after yet another unsuccessful and hostile encounter John records what would become his final diary entry, addressing his parents and siblings directly the night before making his last journey to the island. Brian and Marilyn and mum and dad, you guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Please do not be angry at them or God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to, and I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. Don't retrieve my body. This is not a pointless thing. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand, and I can't wait to see them around the throne of God, worshipping in their own language, as Revelation 7, 9 to 10 states. I hope this isn't my last note, but if it is, to God be the glory. I'm heading back to the hut I've been to, praying it goes well. 
So from that and from the uh, previous day's entry, I feel like the amount of times he's mentioned, if this is my last, I could get killed if they do kill me. I feel like he's almost completely aware of the most likely outcome of what he's about to do in his writing. That's the vibe I get. Yeah, but I think he was aware that hostility was definitely, as I said like earlier, he knew he was going to be shot with arrows or shot, shot at. So I think he kind of was aware that it was never going to be a smooth smooth sailing excuse the pun but um yeah he's he but he seems to think it's a cause worth dying for which is the tricky thing because yeah he's his pure intentions but it's just very deluded intentions as well so november 17th during the early hours of the morning for a reason that likely will never be truly known john instructs the fishermen to drop him off close to the shore for the final time and to return to port blair immediately after doing so the pair would later say that john told both of them with a smile on his face leave me here return to your homes but leave me here. The fishermen recalled seeing John arrive on the shores of the island before a group of Centrelese men immediately appeared from the jungle. The Centrelese began screaming towards him before raising their spears and bows towards him. Before John could gesture towards them, he was immediately struck by arrows and killed. The two fishermen initially retreated but returned later that day, perhaps in an effort to retrieve John's body, but they witnessed a group of Centrelese dragging John's corpse across the beach via a rope. They fled once again but returned the following morning to observe the island as burying John's body on the beach. John was just 26 years old at the time of his death. The two fishermen returned to Port Blair on the following day where, on November 19th, they presented John's diary as well as the news of his death to one of John's friends, also a Christian missionary who was staying there. He then relayed the information to Chow's family, who contacted the American embassy in Chennai, India, for assistance. Two days later, the Indian Director General of Police issued a statement on the restrictions of public access to North Sentinel Island, reiterating their stance that any visit without permission is illegal. In the weeks that followed, a murder case was opened following John's death, though no further actions could be taken against the tribe or those individuals responsible. The Indian government made several attempts to retrieve John's body, but were only met by violent resistance each time, with some Sentinelese either guarding John's buried body. John's family eventually made two posts on social media. In one particular post on John's Instagram page, the Chow family expressed forgiveness for his killers, saying that John had nothing but love for the Centrelese. And whilst they did not go public with any further comment or interviews, Patrick, John's father, eventually sat down with The Guardian, where he made the following statement. John was a beloved son, brother, uncle, and best friend who loved God, life, and helping those in need. John was an innocent child who died from an extreme vision of Christianity, taken to its most logical conclusion. John is gone because the Western ideology overpowered my influence. This led him to his not unexpected end. News of John's death very quickly became worldwide news and very much split opinion. While some communities sent love to the family and referred to John as a religious martyr, others were quick to brand him as an idiotic Instagram revenge blogger with a superiority complex. So one of my interests for you, Ben. Saying that he, d- he deserved everything that came his way and there were also others that found humour in the news quickly heading to give North Sentinel Island a review on Google. Over 4,000 reviews were left within the first week, with local guide Jack Dostein writing, Five stars. Went here for a holiday with my girlfriend. I loved it. She wasn't impressed. Very poor choice for romantic getaway. Great choice for anyone who likes to rough it up a bit. She thought it was hard to get a free table for dinner, but then didn't like how when we got one, we were constantly interrupted by arrows and death threats from the waiters. I loved it. My girlfriend, not so much. Yeah, so I mean, obviously a man lost his life, um, but yeah, people thinking it's kind of pompous American thinking he can do everything he wants. Um, yeah. There are a lot of memes, mm. a lot of memes. They showed some in that, the mission, which I didn't expect. Michael Schonhoof, who is surprisingly a German professor for cultural anthropology, wrote a paper on the incident stating that his beliefs that contacting isolated people groups such as Centrelese still remains a controversial subject matter, even when it comes to being done by experts. He also stated that acts of uncontrolled contact, as well as this case with John Chow, is justifiably forbidden because of the significant risk of lethal infections against the unprotected immune system of isolated communities. See, as I was saying earlier, he got the immunity, he got the uh, injections for himself, not to catch anything, but that wasn't protecting the Centrelese. A total of five fishermen and two other locals were initially arrested for their involvement in assisting and ferrying John. They were initially held under various charges, including culpable homicide, conveying a person by water for hire in an unsafe vessel, endangering human life, and breaking various laws meant to protect Aboriginal tribes. 
All of them were released on bail when it was announced concurrently that North Sentinel Tribe would not face murder charges for killing the US missionary. The other thing as well is John's parents made it clear they wanted, you know, didn't want them to come to any harm or have anything against them because it was John's dream. It was John who put them in that position. John wouldn't want them to be retrospectively punished. And also it was, it was said that John had made it clear if he did die, he didn't want his body to be retrieved. He was happy to be there. That was his mission. He, he's happy to remain there. I think that may have even been from him wanting to protect people, not wanting to cause chaos by or more, you know, or to endanger anyone else coming to the island or, you know, even making the Centrelease people have even more kind of eyes on them. Definitely. So that was the, the timeline for the North Sentinel Island and the murder of John Allen Chow. A little bit of aftermath for you, as well as something quite different. So one of the first things that I did when we decided we were going to cover this case is straight away Google Maps. Let's have a let's have a look at what's going on. Obviously, there's the many thousand Google reviews. um, But when you actually hover over North Sentinel Island uh, on your phone or on your desktop, um, it goes a completely well, this is a really bad example for a colorblind person to say, but it goes like a very different color to most of the rest of the world. And you obviously can't click any there's no landmarks or any kind of street view or anything like that. But the island itself, I was like, what is going on with all this different terrain? And apparently on Google Maps, ignoring roads, train lines and rivers, white land means complete lack of vegetation, sand dunes, glaciers or mountain peaks. Grey land means lava rock, tundra. Light grey land means military bases, bombing fields, restricted areas, which was the case with Area 51. Although when you zoom in, you can see different sort of outlines of uh, buildings. Tan land is sparse vegetation and rocky ground. You can click North Sentinel Island, but that just brings up the two pictures, both seemingly taken from a helicopter, plane or drone. Tom mentioned the God Complex or the Messiah Complex, which many people believe that uh, John Chow had. And this is when someone has an exaggerated sense of their importance, power or identity. And it's actually apparently quite common uh, in people that have bipolar disorder. It's also been linked to schizophrenia and delusional disorder. His father would argue that he would be basically very much brainwashed with the idea of very extreme Christian ideologies. Um, but other people argue that he may have had Messiah complex. We mentioned Chris McCandless, um, uh, the Into the Wild uh, guy. But as well as that, there was another individual that uh, John was very obsessed with, and that was Jim Elliott or Peter James Elliott. So he died uh, two years older than John was at the age of 28. And there were similarities in these cases because uh, Jim Elliott was also on a mission. Um, He was someone that John regularly quoted on his Facebook page and they both met very similar fates. The 2023 uh, The Mission film, which, uh, yeah, as Tom said, it's got very mixed to slightly negative reviews. One person from this film that I found really interesting is a guy called Dan Everett, who is a professor of linguistics and also a former 30 year serving missionary who basically served 30 years, I believe it was in Ecuador. And then at the end of these 30 years, he'd given his life and then decided actually what I'm doing is wrong and there's no benefit to what I'm doing. and I'm actually harming this society and these people. He is interviewed throughout the film and he get, he's really intelligent, really insightful. And he basically says, whilst he does have a profound respect for John Chow, he has a disdain for his actions. And one of his most powerful quotes in the film is, I think it's very unfortunate that we live in the 21st century and we still have people believing first century myths enough to die for them. I was like, oh, Dan. Powerful, isn't it? I've been looking at Google Maps. Oh, yeah? You can... I saw it's distracted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if, you, if you switch to satellite view, you can see the whole island. Fascinating. Oh. But um, yeah. no sign of life. No. Well, we, we promised something a bit different, and uh, we've got something a bit different. Um, Dan, could you play the jingle, please? What, jing- what jingle is this, sorry? It's the yeah, island-based tax. Benjamin Carter's Island Tacts. Ooh. How are you going to survive on this one? Mm, who knows? Well, what's going to happen next? What a stupid name for a jingle. So we do, we do a live stream every month for the uh, prestige members of our website. And uh, during last month's live stream, Dan did a, um, a quiz on diners, American diners, and made a jingle for it, which is my favourite jingle so far. Yeah, it's very good. So off the back of that, I thought, oh, could you just do me a quick one for Ben Carter's Island-Based Tacts? Um, so not interesting facts, island-based tacts. And Tom and Dan, if you're both happy, you've just got uh, a little quiz here that's basically around remote island survival. So uh, uh, before we start, a shout out to uh, desertislandsurvival.com, which literally won't go away from my cookie ads since I spent 
a couple of minutes on their website. You um, love a Maryland. I, I do, yeah, I do. This company offer um, eight day long survival adventure holidays on picturesque and uninhabited tropical islands. On their website, they say that your time on the island will start with five days of training, learning the skills to prepare you for a three day survival phase. The company has islands in Panama, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Tonga, uh, with prices starting from £3,450. But yeah, they gave me a lot of this sort of information for this quiz. So basically, I've got five five questions for you. Um, I, 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 would, I thought it'd be interesting to see who would probably fare better or the same uh, on a remote island situation. Mm. Uh, so welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, question one. After waking up dazed, stranded on a desert island. Desert island? Question one. After waking up dazed, stranded on a deserted island, what is the first thing you choose to do? Option A, find food. Option B, build a shelter. Option C, make a fire. Or option D, find drinking water. The natural instinct is to say water, but it always seems to be fire. Okay. I would be inclined to say the same thing. Yeah, water first, then fire, then shelter, then food. Interesting. Yeah, so, food last. So what, which ones are you both going for? Find water. I'm doing fire then first, then water. They recommend first thing you need to do is find drinking water. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll follow purify that with fire. Yeah. Okay. Can't drink it until you purify it, put it on yeah. the fire. Yeah. That's true. So yeah. Question two. Now that you have your drinking water, you stumble across the following four items. But which one of them is not edible? A. A bunch of dandelions. B. Coxcomb. Uh, coxcomb, not coxcomb. Coxcomb. C, wild almonds, or D, clay. Which one of these things is not edible? I don't know what cox... I can tell you what coxcomb is. Go on then. Coxcomb is the red wiggly thing on top of a chicken's head. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's that's, a very, that's a nice variety of things. I'm going to say yeah. wild al almonds. Not to eat them. Yeah. Okay. Dan, are you agreeing or are you not chewing on something else? I reckon wild almonds are fine. Um, I just think they're the red herring looks. I think yeah, no, but chicken's hat is fine. <laughs> Clay is not going to kill you. It's not a hat, please. If you find a chicken, don't try and take its hat off. Yeah, please um, don't. It's attached. And if it, it. if it does not take it off, it's not being impolite. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know why you eat clay. So you're going clay. Yeah. Uh, congratulations, Tom. You've survived. Dan, uh, you chewing on your wild almonds um, can actually uh, naturally contain a toxin that your body breaks down into cyanide. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm allergic to nuts anyway, Dan. So yes, why double, are you chewing on those? Double bad. Who would have thought? Yeah, so... Me. Uh, me. <laughs> so on, the, on the, the red wiggly thing on the top of a chicken's head, it's, it's a coxcomb and it's served a lot in French, Italian and Chinese cuisine. Dandelion, actually, uh, dandelion wine is a thing and it actually contains a lot of antioxidants. Rhinos eat them in Ice Age. Um, clay... Also, you know, they don't recommend doing this in high doses, so you're on the right path there, uh, Dan, but it also contains magnesium and other healthy minerals for your body. Make a plate, then eat the plate. <laughs> and yeah, the wild almonds uh, naturally contain a toxin that your body breaks down into cyanide, so avoid those bad boys, but if you do find them, boil them or roast them. So one apiece, okay. Question three. Which of the following fruits could kill you if you consumed it on the island? A, apple, B, banana, C, coconut, or D, pineapple. If it was a normal version of it, all of these. Mm. List again, sorry, list again. A, apple. B, banana. C, coconut. D, pineapple. Just realised I've got a bit of an alliteration thing. Oh, A, B and C. That's a tough one, Ben. Yeah, yeah. That's I'm going to go with, if it gets a bit bad for itself, coconut. I think you have too much okay. of that. It's not good for you. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> that sounds good, uh, but I'm going to I want to go apple. Congratulations, Dan. Uh, when a person chews an apple seed... Oh, I mean, that, you could do that here. Yeah, These are island apples, mate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, cyanide isn't... If you get the apple pips for anyway, if you smash them up, you can make cyanide out. Yeah. Well, this is the one that could kill you. When you uh, chew on an apple seed, a compound within it releases cyanide, which is toxic. The coconut, um, actually, Tom, rather than eating it, you'd probably be more likely to die... Uh, from it falling on you. Yeah. And uh, little did you know, uh, falling coconuts are responsible for 15 times the amount of human deaths a year than sharks. Well, two, two points on that, though, on Ben, though. Not <laughs> two. One, yeah. who the fuck's eating, eating apple seeds when they're eating an apple? 
desperate people, man. Mm. But to the apple seed anyway, if you smoke your ground up anyway, it's cyanide. Yeah. But this is just on the island, though. Okay, so yeah. if you get hit by a car on the <laughs> island... Yeah, yeah, avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> Question four. You're on the road and a car drives by on the island. <laughs> um, but yeah, falling coconuts, 150 people die a year from that. Wow. Yeah, probably more people die from that than eating apple seeds. <laughs> <Carol. Yeah. laughs> okay, question four. After a few days scouring the beach, you decide to make a more permanent shelter. What do you go for? A, something up high, like a treehouse or a cliff edge. B, something easy to spot by the beach. C, something more inland, like the jungle or in a cave. Or D, something underground, like a bunker. I'm probably going to lean towards beach. Okay. To be seen by... If, if your mission is to get off the beach. Uh, I'm going to see. See something more inland like mm. the jungle or in a cave. Okay. So uh, desertislandsurvival.com, they, rec- they recommend answer C. Uh, so congratulations, Dan. Um, they, what happens if there's a bear on the island? Good question. We'll, uh, I'll come back to you the on that one. On the sand. <laughs> yeah, but they, they live in the cave. <laughs> They're probably giving you a whole dish of apples as well. <laughs> Well, on uh, desertislandsurvival.com, don't climb trees appears twice on their top 10 tips. Uh, They say that your shelter should be in a safe location away from hazards such as deadwood, falling rocks, sun exposure, flooding or animal tracks. Most of all, it should be efficiently located on a flat surface protected from the elements, close enough to your water and food sources, but far enough away from the high tide line. So do see your logic, Tom. Do see your logic. Final question. You could pull this back for a draw. What is it? Well, I can't peel it back. That's fine. One apiece. Two, one, three, one. Do- it's a slaughtering. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, it's like that pig. Question five. It is estimated that the average human can survive for up to three weeks without food. But how long are you lasting without any drinkable water? Is it A, five days, B, a day and a half, C, three days, or D, one week? I mean, it's temperature specific isn't it if it's a hot place like that sort of a hot deserted island yeah i think five i think what's six what's b six a five days b a day and a half c three days d one week c okay uh, yeah three days you're both absolutely spot on um yeah it's the, the the rule of three three days without water three weeks without food three months with just water no food an 18 year old austrian called andreas mihavitz um was left in a holding cell by austrian police accidentally for 18 days in 1979 um so apparently he holds the record for surviving the longest without food or water and apparently he licked condensation off the walls of his prison cell to survive jesus wow yeah so, yeah, just something a bit different. Um, I thought it was going to be a shorter episode this week, but it's actually worked out sort of fairly sizable. Um, mm. So congratulations. I mean, see Tom's logic as well, but Dan, obviously, the wild almonds might have had their way with you by this point. He might be all right. Uh, he might both survive. True, Dan's already dead before any of the rest <laughs> of it happens. So He's hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> island-based tax. Not as catchy as interesting facts, but we tried. Benjamin Carter's Island Tax. Ooh. How are you going to survive on this one? Mm, who knows? Uh, what's going to happen next? Or a stupid name for a jingle. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very Don't much. pick up that apple. <laughs> and then just finally, a little throwaway one for you. Um, there, that's, are, that's quite there are a number of other highly dangerous islands. They do come up when you search uh, for information about North Sentinel. The first one being Snake Island. <laughs> Where do you get a sound effects for that rather than me? which is also illegal to visit. Off the coast of Brazil, the island is home to between 2,000 to 4,000 golden lancehead snakes, which, based on the size of the island, means that it's between one and five snakes per square metre. Oh, Fans of snakes? I quite like a snake, yeah. Do you? Hmm. Fair play. The island is illegal to visit for both the endangered snakes and visiting humans' protection. Extremely determined wildlife smugglers do make illegal visits to capture the snakes, um, and they do this because the snake's potent venom is prized on the black market. Black mamba. Okay. The next one is Ramri Island, which is located off the coast of Burma, uh, and the island of Ramri is accessible to anyone wishing to visit. However, we advise against it. The island is known as its crocodiles are part of the Guinness World Record um, for the record, unfortunate record, of the most men killed by animals. The island placed host to the Battle of Ramri Island during which there are claims that hundreds of Japanese soldiers were killed by local crocodiles in the mangrove swamps of Ramri. 
Never smile at a crocodile, Ben. Never. That's what they say. No. And what is it? If it's brown, lay down. If it's black, put it back. It's about the bears. If it's brown, lay down. It doesn't sound right to me. No. no. Right. Dead. Do Definitely the opposite. Dead. Stand up. Shout. But yeah. That doesn't rhyme. <laughs> if it's brown, Act a clown. go to town. Go to town. Act a clown, yeah? Yeah. If, if it's, it's black, black stay, stay right back. Attack, attack, attack. <laughs> The final one is Hashima Island, a bit different to the other two islands. Based off the coast of Nakazaki, Hashima is often referred to as the Abandoned Island, the Stairway to Hell, and the Ghost Island. And this came as a result of petrol replacing coal in 1974, the Mitsubishi-owned island was abandoned, resulting in an eerie-looking decaying island some 50 years later. Even though Hashima Island is one of Nagasaki's top attractions, the buildings on the island really are at risk of crumbling. And since no one knows when the buildings might crumble, the government has mandated that tourists can only visit as part of an official paid tour group. So you can't go there on your own but you can go there in a large group in case a building crumbles down. Um, and apparently some scenes from uh, James Bond's Skyfall uh, were shot oh. there. And it is, that one, of all the images, Snake Island, obviously, it's got the, yeah, the, 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 the scary sort of facts to it. But Hashima, just looking at it, looks a bit spooky. And Ramry, oh, dangerous. Thank you so much for that, Ben. There you Cheers. go, guys. That's three places not to visit. Yeah. Uh, unless you, you know, you enjoy snakes and spookiness. That is the case of the North Sentinel Island, the murder of John Chow. I hope you guys found it as fascinating as we did. And, and another new thing, but we've not had enough Ben so far. So Ben, would you like to give us the, uh, the cryptic clue as to yep. next week's case? Absolutely. Um, so apologies once again for the many people who are frustrated with the North Sentinel Island uh, cryptic clue. That was a bit... Yeah, it's a bit out of order, wasn't it? Loads of guesses, though. A um, few people guessed cases we've already covered. Benjamin Carter's cryptic clues. Get everyone gather around for some clues that can be quite cryptic, but he's going to give them to you anyway. Hope you can figure them out. But basically, this week, I thought I'll take it, I'll take it a bit easy on everyone. Um, I've got, basically, I've got quite an easy one and a, quite a tricky one. So I'll quickly share both of them with Tom and Dan before giving you the cryptic clue. Uh, play the music, Bonds. Yeah, so we've, we've, we've picked the shit one. Uh, <laughs> the other one was too obvious, so sorry for that, but uh, yeah. So, uh, the shit one. <laughs> cool. Cool. I wonder what Hannibal Lecter puts all his books in. But you've been compared a couple times recently to um, Carl Pilkington and some comments, Ben. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, this one was like uh, the uh, Rockbusters kind of vibe. Yeah, mine's a bit more PC, is it? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. The one that the one that we said not to pick was quite offensive, but um, <laughs> best. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back again, of course, next week with a brand new case. And in the meantime, if you want more content over on the website on icmap.co.uk, we have close to 150 minisodes over on there. Which um, yeah, they're a similar kind of setup, audio and visual. So why not check those out? Absolutely. And if even if you just want to have a little sort of dip the toe, then we have got a taster tier, which is just a pound a month. Yeah, it gives you access to half the cases on there, which is great. We recently covered uh, the mysteries, the many mysteries of the Cecil or Cecil Hotel, uh, the Nutty Putty Cave incident, the Aberfan disaster, and so so much more. Go and have a look, icmap.co.uk. And like we always say, we say this all the time. Keep doing what you're doing. Oh, yeah, unless it's... Uh, Don't turn up to a bow fight with fresh fish. Yes, 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 yes. Um, get your kayak back. Yeah. It's quite tricky, isn't it? This one, tricky. Um, if it's illegal to go to an island... Yes. Yeah, yeah. No. yeah. yeah. Take the take the initial signals, pick up on them, and go. Yes, yes. Okay. See you later, guys. See you. To the paper.